to Deer Talk Now. I'm Brad Rux with Brian Lovett. Dan Schmidt is not in the office today. He's sick. I think it's a coincidence that deer seasons across the country are starting. I mean, you got Kentucky opening. You have North Dakota opening. Out west, most of the seasons are going on, and Dan's out of the office. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have to check Facebook later and see if we see a picture of Dan with a uh, big velvet North Dakota buck, uh, you know. We really can't confirm that he's sick, but he's not here at any rate. So. We're going to talk about mock scrapes today, uh, a little bit more about Smokies, and our guest is Steve Sorensen, who you're familiar with, Steve. Yeah, Steve uh, is a freelance writer from Pennsylvania. Uh, you've probably read some of his stories in Deer and Deer Hunting. He's also very active on the Turkey and Turkey Hunting Forums uh, as the everyday hunter. Um, kind of makes uh, little handmade scratch boxes that he used for turkey hunting, and he is really the one who kind of brought... Uh, mock scrapes and the preorbital gland lure to national attention with a story he did for uh, deer and deer hunting a couple of years ago, or excuse me, about a year ago. Um, and th the subject is very interesting because I guess it really wasn't like at the forth, uh, forefront of uh, a lot of discussions, you know, uh, but it's one that's kind of near and dear to your heart. Isn't yeah, it? absolutely. I mean, I I'm a big believer in mock scrapes, leaking branches. Um, and we start doing a lot of work on my own farm already back in June. I mean, you get pictures of velvet deer working on the leaking branches. They really don't react to the dirt, you know, pawing it out until October, around the October 1st. But I'm a believer that if you own a farm, and I don't care if it's 40 acres to 4,000 acres, if you have enough trail cameras and mock scrapes, you can know absolutely every deer that's living on your property. Um, the way I do it, we have established sites that have set up in travel corridors or even along, you know, field edges where you know the bucks are going to be visiting. And during the season, especially early season here now, this is a great time, you're going to get every buck that will come by. And they might not spend a lot of time there, but they're actually going to work that licking branch more so. Once October hits, they're going to be pawing it out. But you can monitor your bucks. You're going to know exactly what's living on there. And this time of year is so crucial because those bucks are still in the bachelor group. Sure. And, and, you know, in the next two weeks, everything's going to change. The soybeans here up in the Midwest are starting to turn, mm -hmm. which means they're going to be off that food source. Acorns are going to start to drop where the drought hasn't hit you very hard. They're going to be transferring over to a different food source. So now is the time to get those mock scrapes established. And the basic premise is that uh, they're uh, checking out the scent of a deer that might be foreign to their area, to their, their home range that they're currently using. So they're going to, like you said, they might not stop and spend a ton of time there, but they're certainly going to stop and check that scent out just because of a social curiosity about that other deer, right? Yeah. The, the, you know, I heard it, somebody described it as the business card. You know, basically when, when you, you know, you're doing business with a new client, you put your business card there and, you know, that's how you become associated. That's exactly what these bucks are doing. They're, they're coming to that area. They're leaving some of their scent there as a postcard saying, hey, I'm in this area. I'm going to be here. You know, watch out. Especially your dominant bucks. I mean, that's where Smokies really comes into play. That dominant buck is the one that, that wants to know every deer in that area and he wants to make sure those deer know he's here because he wants to show his dominance. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of my favorite products, you know, for, for mock scrapes is the Wildlife Research Scent Tripper. If you're not familiar with this thing, basically you can fill your favorite type of scent. It doesn't have to be wildlife. I know, John, yes, it should be wildlife research. <laughs> but um, you can put your favorite scent in this canister and you hang it above your, your uh, scrape. And what it's going to do is, in the morning, as this thing heats up, the pressure builds in the bottle, and just a couple little drops come out. So basically, it is freshening your scrape with a scent every single day. Oh, wow. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, these things absolutely work. Um, you know, we got a question somebody had asked earlier in, in our stack here. What should I do? And uh, the guy's name was kind of unique. I'm not going to dig back through it. But uh, anyway, he asked, should I throw the kitchen sink at him? What should I do? I mean, I don't think you want to overload that whitetail with too much. What I do when I set him up is the first thing is, uh, you know, I use a rake to paw out an area that's just a visual stimulus of that deer. Even here in the off season, when I know they're not really working that scrape, I'm, I'm going to make that visual cue to those whitetails so that they come. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to put a scrape dripper in there and I'm going to put some kind of uh, urine or ammonia based scent into the thing. Now with Smokies, I started experimenting with his, you know, I'm just putting a little bit of that up on the licking branch and it, it seems to be very successful. Of course, I didn't bring any of my trail cameras in this <laughs> right now. I could have had tons of pictures for you. Right now on my farm, it's kind of unique because the, the food, the way it's laying out, I don't have mature bucks on my farm right now. I mean, mm -hmm. I can show you a bunch of two-year-olds, a bunch of little baskets that are coming. Does are going to visit that site as well. 
Um, as I said before, the, the soybeans are going to come off shortly. The leaves are going to turn yellow. As soon as they're completely yellow, the deer stop eating them. Right. Those bucks, I got a bachelor group of four or five living about a mile down the road. I can guarantee you in two weeks they're going to be on my property. I mean, I just know they're going to be there. Because you, like we were talking about earlier, you have food on your place this year right now. Yep. Whereas uh, it might be kind of a, a forage challenging year, I guess, in the Midwest, especially with the drought. But uh, so, I mean, you're... you're uh, and attracting with the food and then monitoring with your cameras over these mock scrapes and uh, yeah and and when you're using a dripper like that are you you're using uh, it in conjunction with scent on a licking branch as well uh, you, we started doing that because this is going to be a urine base and it works better you know it works really good when it comes to being in October I think uh, where I said a lot of deer aren't really you know urinating in that scrape and, and working the scrape up with their you know hooves um, I think right now the preorbital is fine because what they're really doing is just working the licking branches mm -hmm. totally. But as soon as they turn hard horn, things all change. You know, and right now, believe it or not, across the Midwest, we're in South Carolina. What a little over a week ago, and I saw one buck that was hard horn there. And as soon as I got home, I saw two that were hard horned. And oh. when we pulled <laughs> cards, we got pictures of hard horn bucks. No kidding. So yeah. it's it's literally probably you know for here at least a week, week and a half earlier than normal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you about that too. If you'd seen any, I saw a buck on my way to work today that was, uh, he was a little guy, a year and a half old, but he was still very much in velvet, you know. I mean, usually I think, but September 1st, about usually the date that they say it's, you know, most of the bucks after September 1st will be hard antlered. But uh, this year, like you said, you're seeing more and more. I mean, do you think that's weather related or drought related? or? I, I think, you know, I think they might have started growing a little bit earlier than normal. It, it seemed like the bucks held on to their antlers longer than normal. And, Across the whole Midwest, it's kind of funny because I talk to a million shed hunters, you know, from Lukoski, Drury's, you name it, even a bunch of the outfitters that we're familiar with. They did not find a lot of horns this year. We know the bucks dropped them, and I was in the same boat. Normally we find, you know, 16, 17, 18 antlers, and we found them three. Yeah. And, and, you know, why was that? I think two things. One is they held them longer than normal. There's more food than normal, so they weren't concentrated. So mm -hmm. our traditional shed antler grill, you know, areas weren't, weren't, you know, weren't productive. And I think going into the season, you'd figured that you'd find more because there was very little snow. I mean, here about the time that a lot of those big deer would be dropping their antlers, so I figured, oh my gosh, if you had a, an area where they concentrated in winter, you'd be in the money. But maybe like you said, because they weren't concentrated at all, that they just dropped them wherever and held on to them longer. Yeah, and, and for whatever reason, I think they're coming out earlier. Um, you know, I was hoping that, you know, it would be a normal year for moisture because then the whitetails are taking in as much nutrition as possible during the growing season. And here in the Midwest, it just didn't happen. I mean, Wisconsin's bad, but it's not nearly as bad as some of the other parts across the country. Yeah, Illinois, yeah. Kansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, yeah. Missouri, just dismal rainfalls. Um, so uh, it probably did have some sort of impact. It's, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see what this fall brings about. Yeah. Now getting back to the trail cameras, um, when you're using uh, a dripper and a licking branch like that on your mock scrape, I mean, how are you positioning your cameras? I mean, you're trying to get right up close so you can really get a good ID on individual bucks? Or? My, my favorite setup is use any of the cameras that have multi-burst technology where you get three photos of them relatively quick. Um, I put it absolutely on the same tree. Um, but I'm normally putting on a fairly large tree, so that, that camera is probably six feet away from where the deer is going to be coming from. Um, why do I like it there? I, I want the burst because it's, if you get a deer head on, you really can't tell a lot from his rack. You mm -hmm. can see mass, you don't even know how many times he is. But when you do that burst, it seems like they turn their head yeah. somewhere in there and you're getting you know three different shots of his rack. And I've come to the conclusion that in the burst mode that you know if a buck comes in, I can probably get his, the score of his antler and the age right, you know, at least the age right, and probably the whitetail score within five inches of that really? deer. So, wow. Um, but we've been doing it for years, and the biggest thing for me isn't about what that whitetail scores, it's really about how old he is. Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, this year, I th guys in the office know one of the deer that I want to try to kill. I mean, he won't score 120 inches, but he is the coolest looking thing. He's lopsided, you know, so one side's a perfect eight, wouldn't, you know, four on one side. The other side is just this super, I mean, that thing's got mass like this and just a big prong, and then it forks, and the forks are big. I mean, they're probably eight-inch forks. <laughs> okay. He's just cool looking. He's four or five years old. I've not seen him since probably a month and a half now, but I'm sure he'll be back on my place. But he's an old buck, and he's just got unique antlers that I'd be love to try to harvest that deer. Yeah. Now, now after uh, yearling buck dispersal and everything kind of settles down, um, 
with your trail camera program that you run, uh, are you pretty confident that you can identify, you know, 65, 80% of the bucks in, in, in they're using your property as a core area? Yeah, or? I think uh, up until October, uh, about the end of October, October 31st, I would say I'm probably 80 to 90% of the bucks I know, even wow. closer to 100% on a typical year. But once the rut hits, I mean, it's a different game. My three-year-olds yeah. are wandering on the neighbor's farm. His three-year-olds are wandering on my farm. I mean, I shot a deer uh, four years ago that was in the mid-40s that just had unbelievable mass. I had never seen that deer once. No you know? kidding. And he came from the other side. He came from about a mile away. So they, they definitely travel. I mean, I wish I was a land baron that owned that you know mile-by-mile mile block, but I'm not. <laughs> um, but I, I really believe... You know, those deer that I call my deer aren't technically my deer. I mean, they're they're living probably on a 1,000 acres, but they're on that property a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you get pictures of them all the time. And then you get, this time of year, the other thing that's kind of funny, we, we work uh, other than scrapes and mineral licks. You know, you put a camera on a mineral lick and a buck, a big mature buck, seems like he comes in there once every week, every two weeks, where the does will hit it every single day. But when the bucks come, they spend some time there. Yeah. And it's amazing. Some of the pictures that you get are of deer that you have never seen them before, mm -hmm. nor do I ever see them during the season. It's yeah. like, where's this thing coming from, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then, boom, he's gone. So it's, it's kind of interesting. But scrapes are not that way. Once you have a deer coming to a mock scrape, especially through the month of October or in September here, it, typically he's on your property. That's a buck. If you want to harvest, start making a plan. Yeah, that's core area for him. He's, yeah. Okay. Those other bucks you're seeing are just cruising, checking for does. I mean, and that's when your your food sources probably become real important if you're holding does on Absolutely. your land right there. Well, yeah. what I do then is if it's a, a target buck, and you'll get some pictures of them at night, you'll get some pictures in the morning, or you get some pictures of that deer, you know, at a particular time. Um, several years ago, we had a buck that always hit the licking branch in the morning. He always came to a scrape in the morning. Well, what did that tell me? It tells me that he's probably bedded fairly close in there because you're always getting them at 4 or 5. You know, early season, before the season started, you're probably getting them at 5.30 or 6 in the morning. As the season progressed, it, it became earlier and earlier. He just had felt, you know, knew there was a little bit of pressure. But you know exactly where that deer was in the morning and where he was entering the woods. Mm -hmm. Now it was up to me to figure out where he was going to bed. You yeah. know? And, and if you can think like a mature whitetail, and I'm not the best at it, but I'm okay at it, you know, I knew you know, if I'm a big mature deer, t historically, here's where I was going to bed, and that's where we hung the tree stand, and that's where we killed him. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you really work from the outside in is what I do. And if you got a series of mock scrapes you know, on your property on the outside and then have some on the inside, oh, I think this is Steve. Hang on. Hello, this is Brad. Is this Steve? Yep. Great. Glad to hear. Glad to have you join us, Steve. You want to give everybody a little bit of a background? Okay. Yes. Sure. Fire away. To, to give everybody your your uh, background, a little bit of what you do, and then tell us about Smokies and how you came about it. Okay. Well, um, I've been uh, an outdoor writer for the past, oh, probably... Uh, seven or eight years, and I've uh, been fortunate enough to, to get most of what I write published, and uh, kind of started out with this newspaper column that I do called The Everyday Hunter, and that's been, been real successful, and I truly enjoy doing it. It just keeps me thinking about hunting and talking about hunting, which is what I, what I called in to do. Um, I met uh, Smokey after uh, um, I met the guy that actually started using pre-orbit of land lure, uh, Smokey, um, uh, the, the guy that was using it that I found was Jim Riggle. Jim is just an outstanding hunter. Uh, I think he's uh, <coughs> uh, about as good as, as the non-celebrities, you know, out there. Uh, several years ago when I met him at the Quality Deer Management Association, he had a rack that when he told me where he shot it, it was just about unbelievable. This rack was 195 inches. And uh, he shot it in Forest County, Pennsylvania, where uh, there's never been a buck at, at that time killed above 160. So I was mm -hmm. real interested in in, uh, uh, in how this all happened, and that's where he started telling me about mm -hmm. using Smokey's preorbital gland lure. That rack kind of got your attention, didn't it, Steve? Man, it sure did. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've I'm not you know really a uh, a big buck hunter per se. I, I, I like, you know, I want to shoot a mature buck. Uh, the, where I live, 
you know, there are a few guys that come up with nice bucks, but they're not usually, uh, you know, year after year. Mm -hmm. uh, a 140-inch buck here is just phenomenal. Uh, but uh, when this, you know, thing's 195 inches, I thought, man, uh, you know, I got to know how he did that. So, yeah. and he told did, me about the pre orbit plan door. Steve, this is Brian Lovett. Did, uh, so after you spoke with Jim, I mean, did you kind of uh, go to the source then and, and try to uh, talk with Smokey and learn more about his product? Well, um, I can't really remember the first time that I, that I met Smokey, but uh, uh, Jim did introduce me to him, and he, he gave me a bottle of it, and I started using it, and uh, right away, I, I began, the first year I began using it, it was after the, the horns turned hard. And right away, I started getting bucks working the licking branches in front of my cameras. So I realized, you know, this stuff really does work. What was so amazing uh, in Jim's side of the story was when he began to use Smokey's uh, preorbital to get pictures of this huge buck, he also began to get pictures of other mature bucks that he hadn't seen before, either in, you know, in spotting with a spotlight or in, uh, in front of his trail cameras, all of a sudden, it's like every buck in the area found out about this stuff and, and came to check it out. So uh, these big bucks, the, I guess I would say the more experience they have with the rut, the more they, they know what it's all about. So by the time they're three and a half, uh, they really are intensely interested in who the other bucks are in the area. And mm -hmm. that's why, you know, the big bucks show up. Mm-hmm. How did, uh, how did Smokey get started uh, with this? Is this something he just, uh, I, I know he has a trapping background, I guess. Uh, did he just kind of extrapolate that and then start uh, taking the preorbital uh, glands from deer and seeing if he could uh, come up with a lure that attracted deer? Well, Smokey is like a lot of trappers and, and, and lure makers. Uh, you know, they're always, wanting to, they're always interested in how the animal's behaving and why he's behaving the way he does. And uh, coming from the, the lure making business as a trapper, uh, he began to play around with some deer scents. And uh, uh, he had never really tried this pre bland lure, but he had made some of it just in, in, in kind of he and Jim got to work on that, and uh, he thought if that buck was a resident buck and is going to hang around, I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know, I think we can get him in front of the camera again with this. He, it was more of a hunch, I think, than anything else. And then Smokey uh, was probably a little bit fortunate, more so than a lot of these guys. Uh, his wife was a pharmacist, and, uh, and she taught him a lot about how to keep these things pure and and how to emulsify them, make them into a liquid that uh, uh, that is easy to handle and, and uh, easy to apply onto the branch. Interesting, Steve. What, what, how do you typically use the Smoky product? Uh, uh, do you just use the the preorbital, or are you using the interdigital, which, if you're not familiar, is the gland that's in between the hooves? Um, how can you describe to everybody the typical use of the Smoky's products? Well. The only product I've used of Smokies is the preorbital gland lure. I, I know about interdigital. Um, in fact, Smokey has asked me if I would try it, and I, I haven't actually tried it yet. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I could say anything negative about the interdigital because, you know, simply because I haven't tried it. But uh, I, I would say that... Uh, and really what I, what I say is based on the fact that I know preorbital gland lure is effective. Um, adding interdigital to the scrape would probably have at least a few benefits. Uh, if they're using the preorbital gland lure to identify the other bucks that are in the area, uh, get acquainted with them, I don't really see how it could hurt to have sign that, that two new bucks were there. You know, one leaving his scent on the licking branch and one leaving his footprint, the scent from his footprint in the scrape. So, so if if the buck wanted to know who's around, if he wants to know who one guy is, he ought to know want to know who two guys are. Mm -hmm. And then, um, 
it might help complete the bigger picture at a scrape. You know, there are a lot of elements in a scrape. There's the licking branch, which uh, research that I've read says 57% of the deer's, the buck's interaction at the scrape involves contact of the preorbital gland area of his eye with the, uh, with the branch. Um, but that's not the only scent that they leave, so it could kind of help complete that picture. Um, it also might help keep deer there longer for trail camera pictures, to keep them, you know, doing more things so mm-hmm. that you get more photographs. And then uh, uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, it might keep them there longer if you're using it in a hunting situation to position them for a shot. Mm-hmm. That's excellent. I guess we should point out too, Brad, that uh, um, <clears throat> Smokies has really hit a chord with the uh, deer and deer hunting audience online and that shop deer. Uh, we're currently in a back order situation with Smokies uh, lure right now, but uh, folks, you can still order it on shopdeer.com. Um, and if you do so, uh, using the Deer Talk promo, we'll also send you, uh, I think it's a deer and deer hunting sticker we're, we're giving away with that, aren't we, Brad? It's pretty cool. It's the, the new logo sticker, that it, it's, it's a cool sticker. So okay. It's a, a truck sticker that you can put on your car. Um, we also, I mean, uh, they just ordered the more Smokies to be able to sell them in the store so you can order it. But we, we're definitely putting that interdigital scent in the store as well. We ordered it. It's not live yet, so be sure to check back, and you can order that probably within a week or so. Perfect, yep. Um, the other big item, you know, that, and I stole this off of Schmidt's desk. I don't know if I'm going to give it back. Oh, he's sick. He won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. He forgot it on his hunting trip. <laughs> Is the new Bark River knife, the new Bark River deer and deer hunting knife, um, it's handcrafted. It's a great value. I mean, they're selling it for you know under two hundred dollars. So anybody that is familiar with the handcrafted knife, I mean, you can't find them for under two hundred bucks. And this thing's great. Comes available in orange or blue. Yeah. Um, quality knife, quality steel. The beauty of these knives are that you can resharpen them. It's going to stay sharper longer. Uh, my personal favorite is the orange one that's right here. Uh, why do I like orange? Because I have a tendency to, when field dressing a whitetail at dark, set that knife down and I never can find it. So, I mean, I think this would be the perfect knife for me. I mean, I really do. And Schmidt's not getting it back. I think this will now be my knife. Well, I think that's only fair, to be honest, yeah. And, and you mentioned the color handle. That's really interesting. We have orange and blue. I mean, again, both colors that stand out when you, like I do also, put your gun or excuse me, your knife down after dressing an animal. And then if you're like me, you go back and look for it and like, oh my God, where'd, my, where'd I put my knife? I can't find it, you know? And blue obviously stands out as this blaze orange on the ground. So it's a, a true custom knife at a great price. It's really a super deal. So, And uh, Steve, we have uh, quite a few reader questions here. Uh, if you're up for them, uh, we're just gonna kind of uh, fire away. I'll, I'll shoot you one and then Brad can shoot you one. And okay, uh, we'll, we'll try that. I'm, I'm uh, uh, just kind of like the the old time stump sitters. I don't know everything and the other guys don't either and we'll just try to help one another out kind of like telling each other where to, where to find a sandwich. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounds great to me. I'll, uh, our first question is from Chris Singer in Wisconsin and he asks, Steve, when is the best time to start making your mock scrape and is it best to do them where a scrape has been previously or start one at a new location? Great question, Chris. I think we could probably talk about that for a long time. Um, <laughs> number one, I thought he was going to say, when's the best time to start using pre gland lure? And I would say to that, any time. Uh, we have pictures of deer using them in the middle of the winter after they've dropped their antlers or just when the bumps are starting to swell like in, uh, in March or April. Uh, deer are using those licking branches 365 days a year. So if you want to start getting trail camera pictures and watch the deer grow, watch their antlers develop, uh, you can't start too early. And that's that's a lot of fun just to see what a buck is like, what he's developing into. Uh, if you want to, if you don't want to spend your time doing that early on, I would say probably uh, middle of July to the middle of August is always a great time to start. They haven't started to open scrapes in the ground yet, but their, their antlers are fairly well along, and, uh, and you're seeing what you've got. Um, they will scrape the ground pretty much any time, but they really don't do it much until, until the antlers are hard. 
so there again, that's another another time to start. Uh, around here, I heard you guys talking before I called in about hard horns, and around here, I usually think of Labor Day. If Labor, if Labor Day is the first week of September, if, if Labor Day comes at the end of that week, most of the antlers have been uh, have shed the velvet at the beginning of the week. Maybe only a few have, but that's that's kind of the focus of the time here. And then, of course, once the antlers are hard, the game changes quite a bit. For uh, uh, location-wise, he also said, I'm going to jump in there a little bit, Steve. Yeah, location, if you're in a spot and historically has scrapes in it, it's a great spot. I don't, I don't care if you print your mock scrape and refresh in one of those that was an old scrape or you start a new one in that area. It's an area that the deer like to, you know, that are coming through, they're there frequently. It's going to work, either one. Um, I, I print mine once I establish my mock scrapes. I mean, my mock scrapes have been in the exact same spots for probably six years now. I really? mean, I've not moved them. I mean, what? <laughs> One we call the hickory. Now we got them named. I mean, they're they're physically named, and that's where we're going to go, and we're going to put them in there, and that's where we monitor our deer. So, hmm. Steve, I got another question for you. This one's from uh, Rudy Valera from Michigan, and he says, uh, "When uh, we are hunting a new location this year, should we wait until next year to try mock scrapes until we can see where the real scrapes are, or should you just try to put something down?" Well. I'd probably try to put something down no matter what. Um, I'd, I'd use the trail cameras even during hunting season if I could. Uh, I don't think it matters to, uh, to wait you know, a year. You're, you're going to get to know the area better, uh, of course, over the course of that year. But I think you can learn more faster if you just get started early. You'll never, I don't believe you'll ever hurt anything by using creating mock scrapes so it's a good time to start even if you're just fresh into the area yeah, I, I agree totally excellent uh, another question here from rod gustafson in minnesota and steve he asks uh, i have approximately 25 acres of woods surrounded by fields and another 20 acres of mostly pine plantations majority of which are too small to serve as cover yet. Uh, said his property holds about a half dozen antlerless deer and he knows there's a good buck within a mile that will certainly visit there during the rut. Um, he asks how many mock scrapes should a guy make along <coughs> the edge where he knows the deer travel? Uh, good question. In fact, it reminds me of, of what I did last year. I, I really blew it last year when uh, I had a place that sounds just like that, about 25 acres of very thick, very wet uh, terrain bordered by some crop fields. And I thought, man, this is going to be a real honey hole. And it turned out to be only does. Doe was a, really a fawn rearing area. And uh, I, I was fooled. I got one picture of a real nice buck. It was a very bad picture. And, uh, and that made me really concentrate on that area and that's the only picture I got of him. Uh, I got more pictures of, of uh, coyotes than I got of, of uh, bucks. Wow. Uh, but I spent a lot of time there. I had four, four cameras in that area and uh, uh, just you know nothing really worked out until uh, later in the season when, when the bucks started chasing does. Then bucks started to show up. That was kind of a, a, a doe area. Uh, I guess his question was putting uh, scrapes along fields. I, I think you just kind of have to judge that by the terrain. Where are the trails coming out into the crop fields? Uh, where are the crossing points if there's any, any water streams around? Uh, what kind of cover might jut out into the field? Um, you know, I, I don't think a small area like that, four or five ought to be plenty. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd start with anyway. Okay. The other factor to really consider is the uh, predominant winds. You know, what's amazing is the whitetail's nose. And, you know, if you have a predominant west wind and, and you put that, that, that mock scrape in an area where the wind's going to blow through your area, they're going to find it. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. 
So it's a huge, and anybody that doesn't know the power of animals knows that trapper does. I mean, I used to trap as a kid, and I remember using a dirt hole set for foxes, and it would go a month without getting anything, and all of a sudden, boom, you catch a fox on there, and he was in that dirt, you know, he's looking down that little hole, and your scent, you would have swore it was long gone, but it's yeah. still there, and it's no different than Smokey's preorbital. Um, you know, an area like that, yeah, if you're working licking branches, yeah, definitely put one on each corner. Um, put it in the funnels. I mean, you can't get, if you got a natural funnel, that that buck is going to come through that funnel area sooner or later. Great, great question. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Brad. This preorbital gland lure, if you'll open the bottle and smell it, it has a faint smell. It's it's kind of a pleasant smell to me anyway, uh, unlike, you know, the urines or the sex-oriented scents. But uh, when you put a drop of that on the licking branch, it's like hard to believe that this is really going to make any difference. This has taught me a respect for the deer's nose that I, beyond what I ever had before. And uh, so you're right, you cannot underestimate the power of a deer's nose. Uh, a lot of those photos you'll get before the deer is actually in your scrape, you get pictures of him and he's licking his nose because uh, oh, yeah. most people know moisture, if that, that nose is moist, they can smell better. And, yeah. and they're always licking their nose when they're coming to the Smokies. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's kind of cool. Great, great, great question, Rod. Uh, we'll give you a, a deer and deer hunting Whitetail calendar for 2013. Uh, Chris, as well, for that previous question. Thank you. Yeah, I have another question for you. This one's kind of, uh, I, I would think you'd be able to answer it, Steve. It's from Mark uh, Janey yeah, out of Kansas. And he says, I put four scrapes in my area, and I noticed more scrapes, but mine are never touched by a real deer. Why is that, and how can I tell how big the bucks are on the other scrapes? Wow, I don't know if I can answer that one. <laughs> it surprises me. If, now, he didn't say that he's using Smokey's preorbital gland lure. Um, you know, is he, is he using uh, rubber gloves, rubber boots? How careful is he about scent? Uh, you mentioned prevailing wind, wind location, or wind direction. Uh, that could be an issue here. Um, I, I, I've done the same thing. I've had some scrapes where you just get them in an area where you see nothing but little bucks. Uh, I've never had the experience where deer didn't use, if they're making scrapes in an area, they've used my scrapes too. Mm -hmm. So that kind of surprises me. I just suspect, you know, maybe there's uh, something <coughs> they kind of they have an aversion to in the spot where the scrapes are or or some other reason. Maybe it's just not on the, the very, you know, it's a strongly preferred trail that they're on and they don't go where he's got his scrapes. I think you're right on the money. I think he contaminated that area somehow with human scent, um, and, and they smelled that before they smelled the scrape. Um, one thing, you know, we, it sounds like you run a lot of trail cameras. We run a lot of trail cameras here. But for the guys that don't have trail cameras, when you have a mock scrape, and once they start pawing the ground, you know, one of the things that you can do is work up that ground a little bit more if you bring a rake. And when that big whitetail comes in, especially a big one, they're going to leave hoof prints in there. And you can mm -hmm. tell if you got a big deer by the size of the hoof print. Um, yeah, you can loosen up the ground with a rake. Uh, yes. You know, so that it makes it receive the footprint real well. Yes. It's not just a matter of moving the leaves aside. I'd, you know, I'd make sure that dirt is kind of soft, at least the, the top inch or so. I, I learned that same trick. I, know, I don't know why I never thought of that, but Steve Martell taught me a trick. I hate to admit it, but he did. Um, when you get a fork in a trail, you know, it's... It, rake out both sides and you can easily see which trail has more activity on it okay so you know it's the same thing with scrapes you know if you work that up a lot and you can't find identifiable track in it that thing's getting absolutely pounded by whitetails you know get your butt over there and hunt on that thing yeah. or get a camera on it <laughs> so what great answer steve all right next question here is uh, from brian amundsen of wisconsin and he asks uh because I've seen the most activity over scrapes just after some kind of precipitation moves through, rather than after several days of no precipitation. Have you found this to be true as well? And are there other times or situations when you see more activity over scrapes? Great question. Yeah, I, I would say my experience is the same. They do seem to be more, ac more active uh, when weather fronts change. Um, I don't know really why that is, but it probably <laughs> has something to do with the way uh, scent is carried, you know, right after a rainstorm, things are fresh. Uh, the deer are a little bit more on the move. Uh, so 
you know, barometric pressure means a lot. I think you get more active when it's rising or when it's falling than they do when it's stable. Yeah, I agree. That's, uh, do, you, do you think some of it might have to do also with scent? If uh, that moisture, is, as Brad mentioned before, is uh, making scenting conditions better? Or do you think it's mostly oh. a function of just increased deer activity in general? I think, it, I think scent makes a big difference. Um, you know, if you walk into, uh, uh, what can I compare this to? Uh, you're down, you're in the food court of a restaurant or a, a mall and you smell all those smells. You know, it gets your attention. Uh, I think it's the same way in the deer woods. Uh, more animals are leaving their scent. The scent stronger, it lingers longer. So definitely, the, the moisture after a fresh rain is uh, is, is going to really give that uh, that nose uh, some overtime. Great, hey. wonderful, great question, Brian. Uh, deer calendar. Thank you very much. Boy, you got all the calendars over there. I'm yeah, going to just give you my uh, list. <laughs> I, I got another question. It's from uh, Kevin Say from Virginia, and he says, is there a, a scent product that you can use for does as well to help you fill a doe tag over a mock scrape? I don't know. Um, one thing I will say about that is the does are interested in the preorbital gland lure as well. Um, I don't know that you'd want to use that to uh, to kill a doe. I don't know that it's all that hard to uh, get a doe into a position to shoot it, but um, I'd probably I probably wouldn't bother to do that because I'd hunt more of the trails on the way to food sources and things like that. But uh, does do have uh, they do have an interest in preorbital gland lure. I don't see any reason why it'd be the same interest that bucks have, but uh, you know, it's just another animal, so they're gonna they're gonna notice it. Uh, I don't know whether that'd be a, something to use to to draw deer into a doe into hunt, but uh, it could be worth a try. Well, I agree with you, Steve. Uh, you know, from the pictures that we get, especially early season, you're talking July and August. As many does as bucks will visit that area, they don't work it for whatever reason. You'll see a doe on it a little bit. You know, you'll get a little series of photos, but they're not working the preorbital. You know, the glands like the bucks do. But if a guy did want to try to harvest a doe, I mean, I don't think it would hurt by using a product like Smokies on a mock scrape. I think the does are going to come to it. Mm -hmm. I prefer to hunt food sources for, for antlerless deer as well. I yeah, mean, It's just it's so much easier having a little harvest plot. And what we always do, if we're specifically looking to harvest a doe, um, keep in mind I can plant food plots, but we always try to position that whitetail where we're not really infringing or we have to go into the core bedding area where we know the bucks are. So we're trying to take her out of the herd without impacting the rest of the property. Right, minimal impact on the yeah. potentially affecting a core or a big bucks core area. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of times where I'm putting some of my mock scrapes, there's one on on the backside of a, a swamp on a pond bank that literally, I mean, I, I wouldn't even want to go back there very often, yeah. you know, because I would never shoot a doe there. This would not. <laughs> so, okay. All right, the next question comes to us from uh, Patrick Lesko in New York. And Steve, he asks, how likely is it to have mature bucks use your mock scrapes in daylight hours during the early season? And does this not change until the seeking phase sets in? Great question. Yeah, I think uh, looking at the, at the biggest bucks that we've seen on trail camera, they're generally at night or, you know, just before dark or, or very, very early in the morning. Uh, a lot of that could depend on what other kind of pressure they have to drive them nocturnal. Uh, but the tendency of bucks is to uh, be pretty averse to daylight until, uh, until the rut starts kicking in, the chase phase comes. So... Uh, yeah, I think it's more likely that, uh, uh, that you're going to hunt over preorbital uh, lure successfully uh, when when they have sex on their minds. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned pressure and everything else. Um, do you, you know, on your trail camera program, do you see a decrease, or I guess I should say an increase in nocturnal uh, activity? Once hunting season starts and these deer are likely getting 
pressured, bumped, uh, encountering human scent, et cetera? Yes, uh, I think that's definitely the case. In fact, uh, I had <laughs> one trail camera up last year that I couldn't get to until way after the season. I, I didn't even want to leave it up during the season, but the creek, I couldn't get across the creek to get it. Uh, during the season, and I worried for a couple of months that I wasn't that I was going to lose that camera. Uh, but uh, when I went to get it, uh, there was very little activity on it during deer season, during rifle season. But immediately after rifle season, the the activity picked up. Hmm. So yeah, I think uh, you know when we're in the woods, we're we're having a lot of influence on the deer more than we realize. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I can tell you this, though. I think those whitetails have an internal clock in them. Um, it's amazing to watch, you know, because we scout pretty hard on my own personal farm, and we run trail cameras, and we don't visit the trail cameras a lot, but you just see a shift, you know, either they're moving earlier in the morning or later at night, later in the evening as the season gets closer. As September's coming about, for us, our season starts here. Archery is September 15th this year. It's always the second full weekend in September. And as you get closer to that season, it seems like those bucks are moving later and later. Um, two years ago, I'll give you a perfect example. We're watching four bucks hit a food plot with, with the dominant ones in the 160s. The, the lesser of the four was probably a 130. I mean, they're all Pope and Young. And I thought we were going to kill those deer so easy the first day of the season. And uh, But timing-wise, it was kind of interesting. You had photos of those guys in the food plot 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 o'clock in the afternoon in July and August. September hit. They were still hitting that food plot, but it was closer to 7 o'clock. And we sat there open at night, and we would have killed one, but the scent, uh, the neighbor's wind was blowing into our area, and these deer got winded him. Oh. They smelled the human scent. I got photos of those four bucks in that food plot every single night, and they were never in the day from that point on. And I, I, we never saw them during the, during the rut. We saw them again. Yeah. They're out. But we never saw any of those bucks during the daylight. And I think that happens to a lot of the guys using scrapes, mock scrapes as well. Yeah. I mean, if they're leaving human scent, you know, it, yeah. it, it could be devastating. It, it's amazing how abruptly deer activity can change like that. Yeah. Excellent. Great question, Patrick. And uh, we'll switch it up this time and go with some uh, Evolved Harvest Clover Crush uh, that we'll send your way. Thank you. Uh, Steve, this is a question from uh, Brian Peters. Uh, and, and he asked, and, and I don't know if you can answer this one because it sounds like you might not use it, but he says, uh, what would happen if I use uh, doe estrus scent at this time of year? You know, would it help or hurt a scrape? Um, that's basically his question. You know, should he use doe estrus scent? Is he saying at this time of the year yeah, right now? Yeah, this time late, of year. August? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Some, I think there'd be a lot of opinions on that. Some people would say it's completely unnatural at this point, so uh, you better not do it. But there are deer that, that come into estrus very early. In fact, uh, I was reading an old copy just this morning of Pennsylvania Game News uh, from 1963, and uh, someone reported seeing a, a spotted fawn in March. Well, that means that the deer was bred, that its mother was bred much earlier than normal, so she could have been bred in August. Uh, it's, it's, <coughs> it's possible, but I, I wouldn't really bother, I guess. Uh, I've experimented with mock scrapes pretty much with every type of scent at any time of the year, and I can tell you the estra stuff really does not work until you know around October is when it's really going to pop. Yeah. Um, and, and even then, if you use the true estra stuff in early October, it's not very. It, there's other things that you can use, just a typical buck yarn if you're going to use a yarn-based product. But one, the other thing is once you get guys, once you get this mock scrape established, you don't have to key in continually putting in scent unless it's in a spot where you have a mature whitetail and you're trying to make him believe, and that's the premises of Smokies, that there is another big deer into that scrape. He's constantly, that's why you're trying to get that bigger deer to come more frequently and you're trying to get him there during the daylight because he wants to beat that other buck to the, to the licking branch or to the scrape. And that's the premises of the mock scrapes. Yep, you've got it exactly right, Brad. 
So wonderful. Uh, next question is from Brian Thurm in Iowa, and he kind of switches it up here a little bit. Steve, he asks, uh, how actually uh, is the preorbital gland removed from a deer and then turned into Smokey's preorbital gland lure? Well, that's a question I guess that we should ask Smokey. Uh, I'll tell you what I what I know, and I suspect that this guy is like a lot of hunters. You know, he's kind of a do-it-yourself guy, and he's wondering, can I figure out how to do this myself? And uh, he might be able to. Uh, you've seen, most of us have killed very many bucks. We've seen like a yellowish waxy substance, almost like the Sandman had sprinkled the sand in the deer's eye. We see that in that uh, in the four corner of the deer's eye. And if that's present, I would say scrape that off and, and save it. And then you cut into the deer's, uh, uh, that area of the deer's eye. There's a, if you look at a, uh, a skull mount or European mount of a deer, you'll see a depression in that area in the bone right in front of the eye. And that's where the preorbital gland sits. It's about the size of a pea. And uh, take that out, squeeze the, uh, the contents of it out, and from there, I think you could probably just use that if you could keep it clean. It, it wouldn't be very easy to apply, but uh, uh, and it wouldn't last as long because you wouldn't have, have as much quantity. But uh, beyond that, I don't know how it's mixed or how it's made into the, the liquid solution, so I can't answer anything, anything beyond that. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. Brian and I were just talking about that exact same subject matter right before the show. It's like... I know where he's getting the product. I know he's probably, you know, grinding up the glands. I don't know how he's making it into a solution that's applicable. And whatever he's doing is, is he's doing it right because it definitely yeah. attracts bucks. Yep. Uh, so. And that's a that's a trade secret he probably wants to keep as well. So it's <laughs> much easier just to order it off a shop deer. I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, I got one more question for you. This one's from uh, Jimmy uh, Jimmy Galvin. Doesn't oh from Ohio. He says I brought some eye gland uh, sent unopened from a local sporting goods store but it was three years old. Um, and his question is, you know, how long would it last or how long do you think it should last? Do you know how long Smokey's is going to last? Well, Smokey says, and I, I don't really know uh, how he's tested this, but he said it'll, it'll have a shelf life of four or five years. Now, th there's a, an enormous difference between this material and any kind of a, a urine-based scent because urine changes as soon as, it hits the air, you know, it starts to break down, to turn into ammonia and, and so forth. <laughs> uh, it, it probably can be kept from season to season. I have some uh, effectiveness. I'm talking about urine, but uh, the preorbital gland lure, it's, you know, has a completely different base. It's an oil base, and so it's, uh, uh, and I think it's much more stable. I have used uh, preorbital gland lure from one year to the next with success so um so obviously from that you can tell it has a long shelf life yeah uh, i agree i mean i was using my bottle from last year as well um throughout this summer and it lasts a long time i mean the bottle seems like it's little but that much sense going to last a long long time yeah, so yeah um anyway steve i wanted to thank you i mean the time here that you spend is great um, we appreciate having you on Deer Talk now, and I, I wish you the best of luck this fall. Thank you. You guys, too. It's always great to talk deer hunting, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That's why we love this show. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you guys have the best of it with this show. All right. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Okay. Take care, guys. You, too. Wow, interesting. I mean, uh, you know, you get a guy that's been using Smokies for years and, and believes in it, and we're all believers here in the office, or we wouldn't be selling it. Yeah. That's just fascinating, I mean, not only how he came across it, but, I mean, just how he incorporates it into an entire program like you do on your place, you know, I mean, from like, starting in summer and getting trail cam pictures and identifying bucks, you know, right through to, you know, the seeking and chasing phases of the rut. I mean, it's just a, a pretty neat concept. Yeah, I know a lot of guys, you know, actually harvest that whitetail over the mock scrape or over an actual scrape. I haven't been that fortunate, but I can tell you this, I can definitely pattern a whitetail better. And once I learn out where, where they're betting or which direction they're going from or to in the morning or evening, I mean, it makes me a more successful hunter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is your chance to order, order some Smokies. Um, we put in the last order, I think, of the year. 
because um, he doesn't have any quantities that are limited. He only makes X amount per year. Um, if you go to the deer and deer hunting shop, you know, shop, enter the deer talk code and you're going to save 10% on it. It works for the knife as well. You know, feel free to go there. The Bark River knife's huge. You know, if you, you know, you don't know about it, go to knifeforums.com. I mean, it, mm -hmm. ask them, a, just post on there, is Bark River a good knife? They're going to flat out tell you those people love these knives. We have nothing to do with, with that forum. It's all independent people. They're going to tell you it's a great knife. It's a great value. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with it. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. And we should point out uh, one other note here. Uh, we are going to be giving away, or giving to 15 people, uh, an autographed copy of Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine, autographed by Donald Trump Jr. Uh, this runs through September 5th. Uh, to win, just post a comment on the Donald Trump Jr. video archive page answering the question, should Trump Jr. have apologized for his African hunting trip or the leaked photos of him posing with an elephant's tail. To enter the giveaway, just comment below the replay. And again, the 15 people are going to win autographed copies of the issue uh, Donald Trump Jr. So that's uh, a pretty neat giveaway there. It's definitely unique. Yeah. I mean, how many people are going to have his autograph? So it's yep. kind of cool. And I really enjoyed him on the show. Just uh, a guy who's from that uh, world of Wall Street and high finance to find out that He's really just a regular hunter like you or I are, you know. Yeah, well, I'm telling you flat out, when he said that he had the, uh, the wild game freezer in his garage, I was like, he's one of us. That, yep. that, that's common. <laughs> I know you have one, I have one, we all have one. So. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> anyway, this is Brad Rooks and Brian Lovett signing off for Deer Talk now. Join us next week. Be sure to tune in to Destination Whitetail tonight. It's on at 8.30 Eastern Time, 7.30 Central Time. Um, we just came off the first month of airing in July, and we ranked as a top ten show. So it's kind of, you know, it's it's fun and it's a different type of show. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.